the Pacific Northwest. Join me as I take you for a trip down the garden path with Amber Watts and Ron Extract. Located in Washington's Skagit Valley, these guys are making distinctive beer, mead, cider, and wine, all with hyperlocal ingredients. While cutting edge, they're all about sensibility, nuance, and sessionable subs. Welcome to No Pants During the Pandemic. Hi, I'm Kevin Brooks, and this is No Pants During the Pandemic. Today I'm speaking with Ron Extract and Amber Watts of Garden Path Fermentation in Burlington, Washington. Hey guys, how are you doing today? Great, how are you doing, Kevin? I'm doing great. Let's get started. Why don't you tell me a little bit about yourselves? You want to start, Ron? Sure, I guess so. Um, (laughs) Why don't you start? All right, you're older. Um, (laughs) That's true. I'm one of the owners of Garden Path Fermentation. Um, I did not start in the beer industry at all. I actually used to be a film professor. Um, So it's a long, strange journey to get to where we are in Northwest Washington. But um, Ron and I actually met in Chicago. Um, We met at the Hop Leaf. If any of you know Chicago beer bars, it seems really appropriate place for us to have met. I got my PhD in media studies. Shortly thereafter, we moved up to Madison, Wisconsin, where I was teaching at the University of Wisconsin for a couple of years. And that was a visiting position. So when it was kind of time to go on the market for the actual tenure track position, that was 2008. So that was a great time to be looking for an academic job when the entire economy collapsed. And the one place that we said that we could never move to was Texas. But the economy collapsed. I got a job at a in Texas. So we moved there. Amber, before you get too far ahead, let's get a little of Ron's background. I've been in um, in beer business for pretty much my entire adult life and arguably a little bit before. When I was in college, I spent a summer overseas in the UK working at a, a pub there and learning a little bit about real ale and about that tradition and also um, learning about homebrewing a little. And then I moved to Chicago for grad school and eventually um, decided to leave the program and um, at that point I I, um, did the concise course at Siebel Institute in Chicago and um, started working at a local brewery. I started volunteering there initially and then worked there part-time. There wasn't really a lot of opportunity to move into the business on the brewing side at that point so went into other parts of the business, which started with retail and then distribution and eventually importing, uh, which brought me to working for Shelton Brothers for quite a long time, which uh, I think you have some familiarity there. Yeah, a little. Amber and I moved to Wisconsin for her career and then eventually to Texas, where I was still working for Shelton Brothers at the time and met the two brothers who were starting Jester King and we hit it off. I started working with them a little bit informally initially as somewhat of a consultant and then eventually joined the project and later became a managing partner. So what does a managing partner do? Um, Whatever needs to be done. When I first joined the company, we were living up in Fort Worth about three and a half hours away. So I obviously wasn't doing a lot in terms of on-site work. At that point, I was mostly managing distribution and dealing with uh, anything that could be done remotely, so helping with some of the business side of things, but largely overseeing sales and distribution. Okay, let's get back to you, Amber. So I'm guessing teaching in Texas didn't exactly work out? Um, I realized it was not the best. We'll, We'll just say it wasn't a mutual good fit, that job. Ron was really happy. He was going down to Austin from Fort Worth every couple of weeks. At a certain point, it's like, let's just move to Austin. So I was working at Jester King on the weekends, uh, mostly in the tasting room. And I just kind of gradually got sucked into that world. And eventually, um, 2013, 2014, something like that, <laughs> I, I came on full time. 
and my job there was basically the job with no name. Every brewery has one. I helped manage the tasting room. I was the primary beer and wine buyer. I did a lot of front office stuff. I was kind of HR. So I did a lot of things that didn't involve brewing or fixing things. So what made you guys decide to leave Jester King and start your own place? Well, as, as Amber mentioned, um, we, we, Texas was the one place when she was doing the job search that we had completely ruled out, mostly because of the beer laws, but also because we're not really hot weather people. We both grew up in the Northeast. We're kind of used to it not being hot all the time. <laughs> uh, I mean, Austin was fun. Austin was a great and place. Yeah, there was a lot but... that we loved about Austin, but it never felt exactly like home. Jester King always worked really hard to source things locally and to have this kind of tie in with nature. But especially during the summer, there was always this kind of battle against nature because when it's over 100 degrees, there are a lot of things that can happen with fermentation that wouldn't be ideal. And we kind of thought about what it would be like to be able to go someplace where it was basically cellar temperature all the time and where um, could source a lot of ingredients from the immediate vicinity. When we started thinking about that more and more, the Pacific Northwest just felt like the right direction to go. And then um, within the state, started looking at a few different areas and figured that, well, if we're gonna make beer, we need malt. And if we're gonna use local grain, it doesn't really make a lot of sense to take grain that's locally grown and then send it hundreds of miles away or to a different state or different part of the country for malting and bring it back again. So we should really be close to a really um, good quality local maltster. So I think we Googled good quality local maltster or something <laughs> like that. And we found Scatcha Valley found Malting. Scatcha Valley Malting and then just immediately, um, as soon as we started talking about our, our ideas and our, our project really connected with, uh, with the folks there, especially the, the founder, um, Wayne Carpenter. Wayne moved he to this valley. This is, um, we're, we're in Skagit Valley. It's in Northwest Washington, um, about halfway between Seattle and Vancouver, BC. It's the most beautiful place I have ever lived. Within a, a year or so of living here, he met probably most of the farmers in this valley. And he learned that they were growing barley. Um, barley is a crop that has been grown here since there's been farming, but it's a rotational crop. There was no market for it. So they were growing, they didn't, it didn't, they didn't care what varietal it was. It, they just needed it for the soil. And for the most part, they would just mow it down to replant what potatoes probably. And so he's like, you have this, a lot of really cool grains here that no one even knows what they are. And you're not making any money off of them. So he got together with another friend of his who was a retired NASA engineer. We all need one of those in our lives, apparently. And he built a malting machine and just basically built this company to give local farmers an outlet for something they were already growing that didn't have any profit behind it. What they're doing is so amazing because there are these varieties of malt that, you know, they're heirloom bridles, they're things that no one else is using that make really, really, really good beer. We've never gotten our malt from anyone else. Any of it, we, we have literally never purchased an ounce of malt from anyone other than Sketch Valley Malting. That's amazing. We're pushing, what, 10,000 breweries in the U.S. right now? And most of them are getting their malt from the same few places. So it's great that you're able to go local on that. And, and all of the grain that they're malting now is grown within 10 miles of their facility, which, uh, as we said earlier, is just a little over a quarter mile down the road from us. So um, all the grain that we use comes from right here. And that's true for all, like all of our ingredients except for hops. Hops we do get from the Pacific Northwest, but all of our other ingredients, um, any fruit we use, the honey we use for conditioning and mead making, and our yeast, um, it's, it's all native yeast. So everything except for our hops comes from within 20 miles of where we are. And it's amazing that we're in a place where that's possible. Fantastic. That's great from a marketing standpoint, too. And it's almost given you your own estate terroir. Truthfully, that was something that we were we were really, um, was part of the original design of the project. I went to visit this brewery in Virginia that was starting an estate production program and found it fairly inspiring. I thought it was pretty cool that they could grow everything they needed right on the land there. So when we came here, that was definitely something that was, was in our minds, this notion of doing this estate production process. But as soon as we went to a meeting with some local farmers that really 
completely went out the window for us because we realized that there were folks here that knew so much more about growing ingredients that we, than we did, that we really wanted to support what they were doing. We wanted to be part of this community and take advantage of, of that knowledge and also of the diversity of microclimates that this area has to offer. This relatively small strip of land sandwiched between the Cascade Mountains and the Samish Bay and um, within that range there's a, a huge diversity of terrain and of uh, climate conditions that allow for a pretty wide range of things to be grown. Basically every mile inland you go gets an extra inch of rain every year. The fact that 20 miles away will get twice as much rain every year as you do is kind of insane but it, it makes it possible for so many cool things to grow here. Growing things ourselves is still something that's really important to us and we do that to some extent. Our site here is not necessarily what we had initially envisioned. We kind of pictured ourselves being on this big old farm with like a historic farmhouse or a historic barn and um, we, we really couldn't find something that exactly fit that bill here where we also had access to water to be able to work with, where we had wastewater processing that we could use for production and where land use and zoning would permit it. And we, we spent over a year trying to find a place that really ticked all the boxes there. We actually turned this site down. Initially, this was offered to us when we first got here and we felt like it was a little bit too industrial for what we envisioned. And we're really, we've kind of fallen in love with it. We're really happy with what this site has become but we're still really looking for opportunities to expand onto something that is going to offer more of that kind of seed to glass experience that, that we really want to offer. But in the meantime, we're also finding ways to be able to contribute to our own uh, growing of ingredients. We work closely with Washington State University, um, which has a research orchard near here, just a few miles from here, um, that they no longer have funding to maintain in its entirety all the way the <laughs> Airport. Um, so we, when we learned that, we went to them with a proposal to take over maintenance of portions of the orchard that were otherwise likely going to be abandoned or just ripped out in exchange for uh, first right of refusal and um, uh, favorable pricing on the fruit that was being grown. So that's where our cider apples come from. Um, it's where we're, we're also able to source a lot of cherries, some plums, some pears, and it still allows us to have a hand in the uh, growing of our own ingredients, even though we don't have our own orchard on site here. When you decided to start the project, what, and I guess who, were your influences? Um, you know, it's really interesting because obviously Jester King had a huge influence on us. I mean, the, the time that we spent there, there's so much about that project that was just really close to, and still is really close to our hearts. And, you know, I feel like um, we, we both contributed a lot to it as well during the time that we spent there. But I also came to feel at Jester King, like we had built something based on this ideal that I'm not sure ever really existed in that way before. Like we, as Americans who are really into this concept that we have of like Franco-Belgian farmhouse brewing, I think we have this idealized vision of this, the farm. The, the farm brewery that you can go and visit and where you have that, where you can have that kind of seed to glass experience and they're growing everything and it goes into beer and you're kind of drinking beer in this, this old barn. And I've personally never been to any place in Europe that's exactly like that. And I've, and I've traveled quite a lot, but um, a lot of my favorite European farmhouse breweries or breweries that are kind of tied in with the farmhouse tradition are actually in more urban locations, either in bigger cities or in some cases in, in, in small cities, but still within the city. Um, and the ones that are even more rural I've rarely been to places where the brewery is actually like just right on the farm and I can't think of a whole lot of examples that where where that's the case. I do feel like we have this kind of uh, idealized vision that's evolved and there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with trying to create something that may not have actually existed before but that we have in our minds and that we think is something that should exist because it's really cool. And you know maybe it did, maybe it still does. There, 
plenty of breweries that I've never been to, and I, I think there there probably are some that are a little bit closer to that concept. Maybe there were more um, centuries ago, but it's. Uh, but there's this vision in our heads that this is what beer was like. Yeah. Um, and especially the kinds of beers that inspire us, and it that may be true, but there's who knows, right? The time that I spent at Shelton Brothers was definitely a huge influence on this you know and, and you spent your share of time there as well we had an opportunity to work with a lot of the best brewers and at this point not only brewers but cider makers uh some winemakers some different types of producers a lot of the the really the best producers and most thoughtful producers in the world during that time we all got to have a lot of conversations about why they do what they do and what's important and those things made an impact Going to visit Tom Oliver was what turned us on to cider. It was such a unique experience, and I knew that farmhouse cider and that real cider was a thing, but I didn't know anything about it at that point. And we went and spent a few days with Tom and just really opened up a whole new world for us. And also, you know, Tom is one of the best people yeah. on the planet. I didn't know so. anything about Perry at that point, and now I really it's something that I, I actively seek out. I didn't really get to spend any time with Tom, but I did spend a little bit of time with Alan and Jane Hogan, and what I learned from them was more than I could have imagined. Having spent the, the time that you did at Shelton Brothers, I'm sure you know firsthand what that's like when you're just around some of these folks all the time that are doing amazing stuff, how inspirational that can be. Exactly. The worst part about leaving Shelton was that I was leaving all those great producers, too. Okay, so let's move on. Why the name Garden Path? <laughs> we have a lot of answers to that question. Our products never quite take you in the direction you expect. We're fermenting 100% with native yeast, and it's all yeast that we've collected from things that grow around us in the valley here. A big part of the reason that we did want to move somewhere with a more temperate climate like the Northwest is that we had this theory that turned out to be pretty true. This is a place where Saccharomyces is going to be dominant. Brett will exist, Acetobacter will exist, Lacto will exist, but those are all organisms that don't really start to thrive unless there's a lot of heat. And we're in a place where we don't have cold winters, summers aren't hot at all. There might be one day where we have an hour of 90 degrees and then it's still 59 at night. So your sack can thrive essentially. Um, so if you see our brewery, we have a lot of oak Everything starts in an open fooder. Um, it's, again, 100% native yeast. Most of it ages in oak for an extended period of time. You would probably expect our beers to be very tart, very funky, but because our culture is so sack dominant, you might get a hint of tartness. You might get a hint of bread, but most of our beers drink really clean. You know, in a way, they kind of lead you down the garden path, um, kind of defying your expectations and put it, putting on a different kind of journey than you initially might have expected. Yeah, I think that that sums it up really well. I mean, we we love sourcing everything locally. We love being tied into nature, working with nature, producing things that speak to the flavors of where we are. But we also really like subtlety, balance, nuance. We like to drink beers that uh, exemplify those things. I don't personally like drinking aggressively sour beer all the time. There, I can find those things kind of interesting, but after a few ounces, I'm usually ready to move on to something else. We wanted to make things that really still exemplify those ideas of subtlety, balance, nuance, while also using uh, hyper-local ingredients and using native yeast. And we felt like it's that's something that's possible to achieve, but it's gonna be unexpected. And it's gonna confuse a lot of people because people tend to look at beer in very cut and dry categories. They tend to think of beer as either being sour or not sour. And it's funny, I've never heard anyone refer to sour wine. Um, and wine typically has more acidity than yep. beer, but it's perceived as much more of a sliding scale when it comes to wine. Like, is it high acidity, medium acidity, low acidity? Where on that spectrum is it? But beer, it's always, oh, it's sour or it's not sour. So people who come in expecting our beers to be 100% clean Saccharomyces beers um, and who have never, like, either don't have any experience with mixed culture fermentation or really just have not liked what they experience, they'll 
we get some people that'll taste it and they're like, oh, this is a sour, I don't like sours. But then we'll get people who, you know, they'll, they'll come in, they'll be like, what's the sourest thing you've got? And we're like, well, we don't really make sour <laughs> beer. None of our stuff is aggressively sour. We make some things with a hint of tartness. And they'll be like, oh, I thought this was supposed to be a sour. This isn't sour. And, you know, so we, we're disappointing people on both sides. That's which, our goal, to yeah, disappoint everyone. <laughs> which to me suggests that maybe we're doing something right. I don't know. But um, we don't brew to predetermined styles. We really draw inspiration from a lot of different things and look at ways in which we can draw inspiration from multiple sources and then kind of draw on that to create something that's unique to Skagit Valley. And my feeling is that unique and interesting beers give rise to styles, not the other way around. That, you know, styles become styles because people in a given region did something that was different, that was unique, that kind of others then later wanted to emulate. Yeah, uh, I think one of the things we've lost, and you just touched on it a little bit there, as did Sebastian in my last interview, necessity is the mother of invention, and a lot of beers and wines the styles that are the way they are because that's what they had to do to make the alcohol. And that's gone now because you can make all of this stuff anywhere, anytime. Yeah, absolutely. I feel like we've done some of that here in, in kind of interesting ways, which are some of the, for me, some of the things that we've done that are the most fun. Like, um, so we make our work next door at Chuck and Nut. Their brew house is designed to work with pelletized hops. So if we want to use whole hops, we tried to figure out a way to retrofit their system to work with whole flower hops and we were cautioned if hops end up in their heat exchanger then we're going to have to pay to get it taken apart and repaired and um or replaced and that wasn't a thing that we particularly wanted to do so we it's a beautiful brew house it, it, it is really a lovely it. brew house it's designed to make really awesome lagers Chuck and I make some of the best lagers in in the u.s some of the best lagers really i think in the world so we we love what they're they're doing there we don't we don't want to be responsible for screwing it up so we figure, all right, we've got to come up with another idea for integrating whole flower hops if we want to use them. So we basically um, came up with this process where our cool ship kind of doubles as a hop back, where we add whole flower hops to hot wort in our cool ship, let it sit overnight, and then strain it off the hops in the morning, and found that that actually pulls a lot of flavor and aroma from the hops. Doesn't pulls a little bit of bitterness, but not that much. And we use that process to make our rendition of an IPA um, called the old school, the new. Um, we also used it to make a beer called the wet hop ship, uh, with fresh hops that we go and pick, uh, from our friend's farm, just a few miles from here. Our friends, uh, Amy and Byron at, at Hop Skagit, they planted what I believe are the first commercial hops in, in the valley since, uh, since prohibition. And we have bought their entire yield each year since they actually planted their hops just, uh, a couple of weeks after we opened. For the last two years, we've gone and helped them pick the hops, brought them back here, and put them in our cool ship with some hot work. Um, we split the batch because we our cool ship will hold uh, 10 barrels fairly comfortably. We normally brew about 18 per batch at Chuckanut, and we bring it back here in stainless steel totes. So what we typically would do is bring back one hot to sit in the cool ship overnight and bring back the other one cool. And for spontaneous fermentation, we keep them completely segregated. So the cool portion would ferment on its own using our house yeast and then go into barrels for um, aging and future blending where the hot portion would sit in the cool ship overnight and then go into separate barrels for spontaneous fermentation and future blending. Um, we used a little bit of a different process this year, kind of a Solera process where we uh, have a, a closed fooder that we put the cool portion of the wort into overnight without yeast and then topped it off with the um, the portion from the cool ship the next day and um, and then kept drawing off of that and then topping it off again with fresh work from the cool ship but for uh, for the old school the new and the wet hop ship we used a different process where we started the cool half of the work fermenting immediately with our house culture and then added the portion from the cool ship that had sat on the hops overnight to the actively fermenting portion in the morning so it's not spontaneous anymore it's using our house yeast there may still be some contribution from the cool ship. It's uh, really kind of a combination of different techniques there that I think is something that's that's relatively unique and that produces, in, in my opinion, some really interesting results. But that came about because that's kind of what we have available to us and those are techniques that just happen to make sense with our resources. That's exactly what I'm talking about. 
So how does thinking like that inspire your beers? Everything we do, it's meant to be unique. It's meant to be a singular experience. We're not ever trying to recreate something, which is why with our, our beer names, all of our product names, there's always an addition number because each batch, it's not meant to recreate what came before, but rather to draw on it and to reinterpret it and to create something new from that kind of same theme, to, to create a new variation on that theme. And I think our experiences, both Amber's and mine, with the real ale tradition were a big inspiration. And like with real ales, you guys are making a lot of more sessionable beers. Yeah, like the point of a session beer is to have a session, to sit with friends, have a few pints, have a conversation, and you know, make your way home fine or, and wake up fine the next morning. It's how we like to think about drinking. Drinking should be a warm and social experience. Um, even in our tasting room, we don't have TVs. I hate TVs in a pub because they distract you. Like, it could be showing, I don't know, curling. I don't care about curling. I will watch curling if it's in front of me. <laughs> It detracts from the experience of being with people. But for me, the notion of session beer also plays into a subtlety and nuance. It's something that really unfolds on your palate, doesn't overwhelm you. So much about beer consumption today isn't, it's not beer drinking, it's beer tasting. And people going to festivals, people going to bottle shares, and drinking an ounce or two each of dozens of different things, maybe, maybe more, and of course, in that kind of context, whatever packs the biggest punch is gonna stand out. But I don't really like to drink beer that way, personally. I like to sit and have a full glass of something and not necessarily have to think about it, but to be able to think about it if I want to, where maybe it's the last sip of that glass when I realize that it's empty, that I have the realization like, wow, that was really amazing. And I noticed something in there that I hadn't noticed before and it makes me want another. That's really what we, strive for in what what we make. That's great. You're not just making beer though. You're making mead as well. What else do you have in the pipeline? Um we packaged our very first cider last week and our first two in fact. Our first two ciders. Um and those are all uh local apples. We have one wine that's pretty much ready to go. We just need to get a label for it. Um we are packaging our second wine next week. Wine is the harder part of the equation for us here. The grapes grow here, but it's not a fantastic grape region. So the wineries that exist, you know, in Northwest Washington, some of them do have vineyards, but they tend to be small and they tend to use the grapes entirely themselves. Um, most of them actually get their grapes from Eastern Washington, which is a very different climate than where we are. Um, so sourcing grapes is actually one of the hardest parts of our keeping everything local equation. The wine that is pretty much ready is a varietal called Madeleine Angevine, which is kind of a French varietal that takes well to wet weather. The biggest problem with grapes is that if, it, if the rainy season comes early, they burst on the vine. So you need a moisture tolerant. Uh, varietal. And so Madeleine Angevine and another varietal called Zigariba are the two that people kind of understand work here and work well here. But um, our Mad Ange, it turned out really beautifully. Um, it's kind of a pet mat. It's in a clear bottle. It's complicated, but also pretty easy to drink. It's exciting that that's a thing we can do here. The state of Washington makes it easy to stack a winery license on a brewery license so you can do everything pretty much in the same space. Wine and cider do take more time than beer does, but we're excited that soon enough those things will be out there. And then as far as other projects go, anything that grows here that it's fermentable, as far as I'm concerned, is something that is of potential future interest. With the orchard I mentioned earlier, there's also an abundance of cherries there, which are mostly sweet cherries, but there are some tart ones. We've used them in both beer and mead for re-fermentation, co-fermentation in the past. I look forward to doing some more experiments with cherry wine and plums. We, we have uh, a lot of plums too, so some plum wine or a variation on umeboshi or something along those lines could be, could be pretty fun. And I feel like there's just a whole world out there to explore. So I'm excited to see where that takes us. Really exciting stuff. 
Now, how has the coronavirus been affecting Garden Path? Well, we actually started to feel the impact fairly early because um, earlier, early in the year, we were uh, we'd been in, in talks with importers in um, South Korea and mainland China about sending small shipments to those countries, and had actually shipments were all ready to go. The uh, Korea one had even already been paid for, and then coronavirus hit in Asia, and we, that was the first thing that we saw was that those orders were postponed. And then we started to see the same thing happening in the U.S. with a lot of our distribution orders. Very quickly after that, things started to escalate, and we realized that we were very likely going to have to close down our tasting room for any kind of on-site business. And so did everyone else As, in our as state. did everyone yeah. else. And um, we, we came to that realization a few days before the actual order came through that pretty much killed not only our own on-site business, well, it did completely kill not only our own on-site business, but the majority of our uh, in-state sales too, because uh, most of our the other accounts that we sell to are, are on-premise, they're bars and restaurants. So that really kind of left us without much of an outlet for distribution. So what have you been doing? We've had to pivot quite a bit to kind of find new outlets, new ways of doing things. We, we basically shut down production at that point, too, because it was it's really hard to do any kind of production if on this scale. If you don't know if there's with, a market. Well, and also there. while maintaining social distancing. Yeah, and exactly. And uh, kind of small hands-on operation. It's not like you have one person that can just control everything from a control panel. but. We, uh, we did start doing delivery and, and pickup service for the tasting room. And one thing to note in our tasting room, we sell our own products, obviously, but we also have a pretty extensive bottle shop where we have guest beer, wine, cider um, from around the world. So it's not the worst time to be a bottle shop. I mean, our numbers are not close to what they would normally be this time of year, but it's kind of kept us afloat. And we've, we've also yeah. been delivering about once every two weeks, we've been doing deliveries to Seattle, which is uh, a little over an hour from here. And then we, uh, we also just uh, implemented an online shop, um, which is still kind of in, in beta mode, but it is live that allows you to place orders online. We will soon be adding to the shop shipping throughout the state and potentially in other states as we're able to uh, get, get appropriate um, permission yeah. to do so. Slowly, most states are beginning to open up. What's your next step? Well, I just apparently found out while we were having technical difficulties before that we've been approved for phase two as of like now. So after this, I'm going to have to scramble to get everything ready to go. Um, possibly tonight we can open for phase two. And what that means here is that um, restaurants, bars have to be at 50% capacity. Um, no bar stools, can't touch anything. We're going to move all our seating outdoors to separate people as much as possible. Our space isn't that big, and there is a bottle shop that people will browse. But, um, yeah, we'll see how that goes. Well, congratulations on making it to the next stage. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I know you guys have a lot to do tonight, so let's wrap this up. I appreciate all the time you've given me today. Well, well thank, thank you so much, Yeah, Kevin. thank you so much, Kevin. We really appreciate your taking the time to do this, not just for us, but for, for everyone that you've been talking to. I mean, as you point out in the preface of this project that the industry is hurting right now. Everyone's hurting right now in different ways. And uh, it, I think that it's it's great that you're, that you've taken it upon yourself to do this project and to um, have these conversations. So thank you for that. Yeah, thank you. It's been my pleasure. Good luck with the opening and I'll speak to you guys soon. If you want to learn more about Garden Path Fermentation, you can visit their website. The link is in the video's description. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.